Welcome to another episode of Purchase to Profits. I'm Seth Ferguson. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss our daily interviews with successful real estate investors. Our guest today started investing at the age of 22 and went full-time just two years later at the age of 24. He now focuses on building investor relationships to acquire value-add apartment communities in Indiana and Southwest Michigan. Joel Florick is the owner of JF Holdings. Joel, welcome to Purchase to Profits. It's great to have you on the show. Hey, thank you very much for having me and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, you're very welcome. And I'm always excited to talk with uh, the young guys on the show too. So uh, I know in the introduction, uh, you started at 22. How old are you uh, right now? Currently 25. uh, 25. I'll be turning 26 in just a couple months. Yeah, I I wish I could go back in time (laughs) to when I was 25. (laughs) Good times, good times. All right, so to kick things off, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, your real estate goals right now? Yeah, currently I am focused on scaling up, uh, partnering with other investors uh, in order to tackle larger apartment communities. Ideally, the project size is uh, 50 to 100 units, Uh, have uh, a number of deals that are in the pipeline right now, Uh, just finished a couple property tours, have a few more on some additional deals in the coming weeks uh, where the numbers look very good, really like the uh, location within the markets. Um, so very excited to see where those end up coming, but hopefully within the first half of the year here, we'll be able to get something under contract and be able to, um, start the ball rolling forward. Uh, ultimately the goal being to focus on continuing to buy larger apartment communities focused in Indiana as well as South, uh, Southwest Michigan, uh, as you had, uh, mentioned. Yeah. And so what does that scale look like? Do you have a goal of saying, you know, I want to acquire X amount of dollar volume this year, or do you want to hit a certain unit count? Like, like what are you striving towards right now? So my personal ambition is a million dollar a year income. And I have that specific dollar amount because I've, you know, gone through the exercise of listing out the type of lifestyle that uh, myself and my wife Uh, would like to have for our family, have a young daughter. Uh, She'll be two here in a couple months as well. And uh, when we look at, you know, the type of things that we would like to have, the type of experiences that we want, um, factor in some taxes in there. And, you know, roughly speaking, that million dollar number um, gets us to where we want to be. Now, what does that look like from a unit count? If we're looking at the Indiana market, the B and C class assets typically going to be acquiring stuff between thirty thousand to sixty thousand a door. Um, ultimately, my goal is five hundred units, one hundred sixty bucks a month in cash flow, roughly. So that's how essentially I break down that million dollar number to be realistic based on the market that I'm targeting. So what does that look like in the future? You know, ideally, um, that you know, looks like a, a handful of apartment communities that, you know, eventually I might own myself, um, have a team that uh, manages the day-to-day operations. I focus on managing and supporting the team. Um, but I looked at two paths to get there. Do I slowly acquire slightly larger assets using my own capital? And as you mentioned, I do this full time. So the only capital I have comes from value add that I can do, you know, perform to my own assets. So I looked at that and said, okay, that's probably a pretty slow process uh, in order for me to get to that 500 unit number and focusing on the larger assets. Uh, So as I mentioned, my goal is to work with other investors, partner together, tackle these larger projects. Um, So, you know, from a unit count number, um, ultimately, you know, probably talking a few thousand units Um, that ultimately we'll be trying to scale up to. um, So that way I can hit my personal goals um, that I have. Yeah. And and the larger deals are a great vehicle because you have that scale of the project pushing you ahead. So that's awesome. I I wanted to ask you, um, most guys when they're 22 have other things on their mind besides real estate. You know, what, what got you started in the first place? It stems from 
uh, being very close with uh, my mom and dad growing up and understanding how they used real estate to try and achieve some of the financial goals that they had. Their focus was fixing and flipping houses that we lived in, occasionally hanging on to properties as rentals. Yeah. Um, seeing that uh, the successes that they had, some of the failures that they had, getting to work you know, right by my dad's side on renovations, uh, I got a lot of experience. Um, ultimately then, when I went to college and said, okay, what do I want my life to look like? What do I want my personal financial picture to look like? The one thing that stood out to me was I wanted financial independence. I didn't want to you know, have uh, an experience like 2008 come around where you have you know, millions of people losing their jobs, not being able to afford their mortgages, their car payments. That's, that's scary um, when you think about it. Uh, to me, knowing that I can support myself through the assets that I own uh, was, was really important. So when I looked outward and said, okay, what's the best avenue to achieve that? Number one, okay, I understood real estate, the basics of it. I understood, you know, clean up a unit, rent it out, what have you. Um, understood renovations, but then said, okay, who out there really achieves that financial independence? So the people who treated real estate as a business were typically the people who were out there achieving scale in multifamily real estate. So I said, okay, those people are doing it. Why not me? Yeah, absolutely. So what changes did you have to make about the way you thought about real estate to go from those smaller deals to now jump up to those larger deals? The biggest challenge is uh, not having as much control over the minor details. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, I grew up remodeling things with my dad. So yeah, an electric water heater takes me an hour to replace myself. Uh, I'm going to have to pay someone three to $400 in labor charges for them to go do that work for me. That, that can be tough uh, to get that invoice and pay that bill knowing I can do that a lot faster than him for a lot cheaper. Um, but what's the goal of this whole thing? Okay, there's the financial piece, but it's also the lifestyle. And that's the one thing from a mindset that I have really focused hard on over the past couple of years and the past year in particular is saying, I need to let go of certain aspects of my real estate business to others so that way I can be able to have a better lifestyle uh, for myself and, and you know, my, uh, my family. Yeah. And so I, as, you're, as you're starting to partner with investors to grow your portfolio, what, what does that, what change, like, I'm just trying to understand maybe somebody's watching and, and, and they're thinking maybe they're doing sing, single families right now and they want to get into the larger projects, you know, but they're scared of partnering with an investor because, you know, maybe they don't have the confidence, you know, what can that person do right now to set themselves up so then they can start raising money from others? Yeah, it's really good that uh, you brought that up. So I've thought a lot about that problem over the last year and what I kept coming back to time and time again was I need someone with a little uh, uh, gray hair <laughs> on their yeah. head uh, in order to uh, help me out. It can be challenging speaking with you know older professionals saying, "Hey, I, you know, I want to go after this large asset. I have you know a track record. Oh, okay, it's maybe only four years right now uh, within my own portfolio, but." it can still be a hard sell to say, hey, would you write a $100,000 check along with a number of other investors so that way we can go after these deals? You should trust me, right? Um, th those conversations can be a little bit difficult. Um, and as a younger person, um, there's also the standpoint of your network. And naturally, as you get older, the people that you went to college with uh, the people that you've met throughout different experiences in your life are naturally moving up the ladder in different ways. Um, so as you get older, you tend to 
have a little bit broader of a network as well. Um, so I said, okay, what is the highest likelihood chance for me to be able to go after these larger apartment communities and be successful? Well, I need to bring on somebody who has uh, a little bit more experience raising money, ideally has been doing it in the real estate game. Um, uh, I met an individual, Rick PD. Uh, he has a portfolio in Northwest Indiana, a uh, little over uh, 150 units. Single family, small multifamily, he has the same goal of scaling up to large multifamily assets. His partners in his day-to-day -day business uh, they really enjoy those smaller asset classes. So he's going to continue to let that team manage and grow that business. But ultimately, we're teaming up together to be able to go after this goal of tackling larger apartment communities in Indiana and Southwest Michigan. Um, he is able to bring a stronger network to the table. Uh, he also has a longer track record of being successful in the real estate industry he has raised money for a lot of his deals. Um, so I feel like that complements well with my ambitions and desire to spend a lot of time focusing on the acquisition as well as the execution of the project. Um, so our skill sets coming together are going to help me able to, you know, me to be able to be more successful. Um, so partnerships, I think, are, you know, key when you feel like you're really lacking in an area. And as I've had more conversations with investors, uh, one of the things that they really like hearing is they say, you know, each of you have kind of your lane that you wanna focus in, that you're an expert in. Um, they really like that about, you know, Rick and I working together in order to tackle these. And that builds additional confidence when we're able to say, you know, I'm better at this and he's better at that. And that's why, you know, we're able to come together. So it, it's helped us too in our investor conversations as well. Yeah, no, that, that's a really great point. And that's a beautiful thing about the, the larger assets like multifamily. It, it's a team sport at that level. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody can do it on their own. It just doesn't exactly. happen. Um, and, and when you're able to find people that complement the skills, you know, your weaknesses, uh, you know, you have two people come together and two plus, you know, one plus one equals, you know, three at that point. Cause uh, you know, it's just building on, on your mutual experiences. That's great. Um, so right now as you're looking to scale your business um, you mentioned uh, lifestyle uh, quite a few times in talking about this. Um, what sort of routines or do you have any rituals that you do maybe daily or weekly that helps keep you focused on, on what's important? I play hockey every yeah. uh, Monday night, so I'm in a men's league. I started that uh, about six months ago, and that's really helped me out. Uh, it, it goes year-round, so I'm looking forward to uh, being able to keep hockey in my life moving forward. Sailing's uh, a really big passion of mine. Uh, it's actually how my wife and I met. Okay. So we live in an area where we can do a lot of sailing through the summer months. Uh, it's a, you know, four to five months sailing season for us here in uh, Michigan city, Indiana, but uh, Chicago, St. Joe's close to us. So we try to make sure that during the summer we get out on the water, we're doing the races, uh, we're, you know, socializing in the different events. We're, we're kind of providing that lifestyle um, that we really like of, of being on the water, being on the beach. Um, so if it's a, it's, if it's a beautiful day on a Tuesday, um, yeah, let's put work away for a little while and let's let our daughter, you know, go run around on the beach and go for a walk and, um, you know, get a chance to kind of decompress. And then maybe I stay up later that night and get some work done. Um, it keeps a little spontaneity in our life. Um, keeps things a little fresh when we don't stick to a super rigid schedule. Um, on that same note, we really like traveling. So both my wife and I get a little stir crazy when we're uh, in Michigan City for more than maybe a month at a time. Um, so almost on a monthly basis, we're kind of traveling somewhere. Um, it might just be for a weekend. It might be for an entire week. I can still work 
um, you know, from my computer and get things done. Um, so it's certainly not totally turning off, but uh, we just got back from a trip northern Michigan. Uh, we go up there a lot. Uh, it's where most of my portfolio currently is. Um, but my family's also from there. So whenever we go up, I typically plan two to three days of dedicated work time, uh, working on my properties, meeting with bankers, meeting with, uh, you know, any other team members that I have up there that, you know, I might need to work with. And then we planned, you know, other days around hiking, uh, you know, sailing, camping. So we really make sure to kind of work, uh, mix work and play together. Uh, and that's something that has made it the journey a lot more fun along the way. I, 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 I frankly haven't gotten burnt out yet. Um, and I think that is, is kind of a large part, uh, you know, to why that hasn't happened is, you know, like I said, we, we just, we try to keep it fun and, um, make sure that, you know, if we're taking a, you know, trip somewhere, we can mix in, you know, some property searching, what have you, uh, maybe some meetings, mix in a hike or two. Um, so, yeah. And so what sort of systems have you had to put in place that allows you to just to pick up and leave for, let's say four days and have everything keep running? Yeah. A uh, big part of that is all of my uh, kind of records I, you know, keep on Google drive so I can access, you know, if, if a banker calls me and, you know, Hey, can I see X, Y, Z document or if it, you know, tenant has an issue or, you know, what have you, I, I have, you know, all of my leases, all of my bank records, all of my insurance records are all accessible anywhere on any device. If, my laptop breaks, it's, it's fine. It's okay. I, you know, I can still have access to that. So that's been really important, um, for being able to continue to work wherever you're at. Um, the other thing too is, um, scheduling out the type of work that you're going to do. Um, so I have planned through the month that I know, okay, I'm going to go to the property in South Bend, Indiana on, you know, these days to do some property renovations. And I block that out in my schedule in advance. And if any little things are coming up, if it's not urgent, uh, I push it back to that time. And I knock out a lot of projects in a two or three day period. And then I can kind of turn off. So rather than being reactionary to just everything that happens, being more proactive as to and deliberate about your approach to getting work done, I think is really important if you kind of want to live that active, uh, you know, lifestyle, being able to, to do a lot of travel. Yeah, no, those are some really good tips. Um, so out of all the deals that you've done so far, is there one that stands out as a, as a keystone deal? Uh, absolutely. Um, there are two, uh, but one in particular, I, I think is a great story, especially with the timing of this podcast. So, uh, my second deal in Iron Mountain, Michigan, uh, was a 16 unit property. Uh, again, I was 22 at the time. Uh, I had just bought my four unit. It must've been, uh, about six, seven months previous, uh, when I heard about this deal and, uh, kind of the first part of it was trying to figure out, well, how the heck do I buy this 16 unit property? Ultimately led down this path of, uh, we put together 80% uh, commercial bank financing uh, through a local lender. Uh, and then the seller did a 16 and a half percent seller finance note. Uh, that was a 10 year amortization, uh, three year balloon uh, with a 2% interest rate. And, that allowed us to close after prorations uh, and a small personal loan that I picked up. I only put $5,000 of my own savings down to buy that. Uh, but I knew the property cash flowed really well with the way that we structured the financing, uh, that, you know, very low interest rate. So that worked out, you know, really well to kind of get things going. Over the last three years, though, I've really focused hard on uh, implementing 
the kind of the value add plan. I've done light renovations in some of the units as tenants have turned, uh, but primarily it's just been marketing the property better than the previous owner. And that's allowed rents to bump up. Uh, now I'm getting $150 more per unit than where the previous owner was getting when I had acquired the property. So last week, uh, we just finished up the refinance on that property. So I had originally bought it for $685,000. Um, like I said, I, I only put 5,000 down. Uh, it just appraised for 910,000. Nice. Uh, so I was able to refinance that property, uh, pay back the seller note since we hit our three-year balloon. and. Uh, I was able to build up enough equity in the property where not only do I have 20% uh, you know, equity uh, based on uh, that 910 valuation, but I could unlock $140,000 line of credit to allow me now to put that cash towards uh, new properties. Yeah. Um, so ultimately you know, kind of the three-year life cycle of that deal. It was the high leverage in order to buy it, execute the value add, refinance, lower my payments. So I cash flow uh, about $750 more per month now um, because of uh, just the way that all the financing got structured. Um, so I cash flow better now. I, I unlock capital. So ultimately just a, a really fantastic deal. And, and the thing is it obviously, you know, performs very well for us yeah. um, to, to provide us with that lifestyle we want. For, for sure. And, and I think you, you probably, probably caught a lot of people's attention by saying you only had five grand um, in the deal. Um, I, do you want to maybe talk about uh, your, your game plan in approaching this deal and thinking about how you could put the, different pieces together to make that possible? Yeah. So when I first started the discussion with the seller, he was very adamant that he would not do any sort of seller financing. Rather than push the subject, I said, okay, it's not a problem. Uh, I don't have enough cash myself in order to close this deal. Uh, with the traditional 20% down, I do have a bank that's willing to work with me though on 80% LTV. Um, so I'm going to have to figure out something else. I said that there were a number of individuals that I could reach out to who might be interested in partnering with me on the deal. Uh, you know, can we walk through the process, you know, get all the numbers in place and, you know, give me a chance to go talk to these other individuals. Well, about a two month process of me, you know, talking to potential investors, ultimately running into the roadblock of uh, lack of experience uh, they wanted too much of the deal. I also didn't have the knowledge at the time of what is syndication. You know, how are people structuring these partnerships? I, you know, I, I didn't understand what kind of typically happens in the industry. So I didn't even know the right questions uh, or, or solutions to be kind of seeking out. Um, Ultimately, though, I was very honest through the entire process. Um, I, I called the sellers back after a couple months of you know trying to find a solution, and I you know basically said, "Hey, I really appreciate it. Um, I still really like the deal. I'm still going to be trying to find options, but you know the couple of avenues I had, you know, they're they're not turning out to be a viable solution for me to bring the money I need to the table." Um, so since, you know, appreciate it, but, um, you know, I, I don't want you to, you know, be focusing too much of your time. I, I want to be respectful of that. So, you know, go out and try to find somebody else. And a week later I got a call saying, Hey, we'll, we'll do a seller second on this. So I <laughs> did not expect that to happen. Uh, it was kind of one of those where, uh, hung up the phone and, you know, did a little dance and, uh, in the living room was pretty excited that, you know, wow, you know, I'll get a chance to knock this thing out by myself. And to negotiate that though, the one thing I did is I went back to my underwriting and I said, you know, in order to do the high leverage, I 
can't exceed 55,000 in total financing costs between the bank and the seller. No, if I go beyond that, I'm just not comfortable with it. Yeah. Um, it, it just seems a little too risky. So we, uh, we had another call scheduled when I got on the phone with him. Uh, I said, Hey, you know, appreciate the offer. Uh, you know, really excited to try and knock this out. I can't exceed this, you know, the 55,000 number. Here's what the bank is willing to do. Can't change what the bank's going to do. So ultimately, you can adjust the amortization, you can adjust your price, you can adjust your interest rate, but we have to make sure that whenever your balloon comes due on your note, that I have 20% equity built into the property based on our purchase price. So ultimately, he said, okay, I understand. And a week later, uh, he and his partner came back and they presented me with an offer. Uh, they hit my number. So obviously my answer was, you know, simply, yes, let's yeah. do this deal. That, that's great. And how did the, the bank feel about, um, you know, the, the seller carrying that, that second for you and you being in for so little, did they raise any objections? They didn't raise, well, I guess. Uh, so there were two different banks that I was working with. Um, there was the bank that I financed my initial four unit with, and then there was a bank that currently held the loan on that property. Initially, the bank president uh, for the bank that held the loan on that 16 unit, he didn't have any issues with it because he knew that property well. He thought it was a really great asset, but when he brought it up to his loan committee, ultimately that got shot down. And we were already under contract on it at that point. Um, we were two weeks away from closing when the bank came back and said, sorry, can't do this. But like I said, I had the bank that I had financed my four unit with. I had already had them put together a loan proposal. It had already gone through the approval process at their bank. So I knew that I had that backup. Luckily, they were able to move fast, you know, made a phone call and said, hey, you know, let's do this. You guys are getting the loan. And uh, we were able to still close uh, within the original time period that we put together. Yeah. Um, so it, it worked out well. So to, to your point, still ran into challenges. Um, one of the banks ultimately pushed back. Uh, but the bank that uh, I originally had a relationship with was willing to work with me on that. Um, yeah. In my experience, uh, I did a, a, an eight unit purchase in South Bend, Indiana with this same structure, 80% uh, bank financing, 10% seller second. Uh, so in that case, you know, having that experience uh, with the eight unit, as well as on this 16 unit, uh, worked with, you know, half a dozen different banks on kind of analyzing those deals and putting together proposals. Um, the one thing that made a big difference was putting together a good proposal for the bank. So I put, you know, photos of the property, description of how it's been performing. What am I going to be doing to the asset? I put together my underwriting on the property. Um, I put together all the other financial statements, what have you. And I send this, you know, essentially this big email with, you know, all of these documents that provide just tons of information uh, to the bank. When I just did my refinance on the 16, I actually switched it over to a different bank that gave me a more competitive proposal. And uh, when I sat down with the banker during closing, he said that, you know, ultimately the information that I provided was better than 98% of all the clients that they work with. Yeah. So he said it was really easy for them as a bank to be able to make a decision to, allow me to refinance and get this large line of credit. But that's the same story I heard, you know, when doing that seller second. So it's really important that you put together a good proposal, lots of documentation, give the bankers everything that they need in order to push that loan through, make it really easy for them. Yeah, no, that's a really good point because you know, you have to treat this like a business and you're, and you're doing a business proposal to the bank. You can't just come in with, you know, all your documents in your pocket, all, uh, you know, crushed up and stuff like that. 
Um, so it, how has, you know, you've been doing real estate for not too, too long. You've still got many, many, many more years of investing ahead yeah. of you. Um, how has real estate changed your life so far? I, I think the biggest thing is hitting that uh, financial independence goal. I hit a lot faster than I thought I would. But the exciting thing about that is my stress level with kind of the finances around my life has just, it, 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 it's pretty much gone away. Um, and that's huge. When we had our daughter on the way, um, I had to decide, was I going to leave my job or was I going to have my wife leave her job? Um, in order to kind of change up where we were living. And, you know, I wasn't happy in my corporate career. You know, I had already had the real estate. All of my basic expenses were covered. So yeah, not a problem. Put in my 30 day notice and, um, you know, I'm leaving my job, making the move to where she was at at the time. And, you know, we could start building our life in that area. When we had our daughter, um, my wife, had the summer off uh, because she was a school counselor. When she went back to work, though, she really struggled. Um, she wasn't happy. Well, we're okay. We have the real estate backing us up. I said, leave your job. It's fine. And she left her job. She, she hasn't been working for you know, a little over a year now. Um, but her happiness in life has just, you know, it, it, it's, it's gone up exponentially from where she was at when she was trying to balance a career and wanting to be a really involved mother. Um, so for us in our relationship, being able to make those kind of decisions, I, you know, kind of on a whim is, uh, it, it, it's kind of crazy when you think about, you know, how challenging it can be for most people. Um, so that financial independence, I think, is is really the most important piece for us. Um, I, I get to go to uh, swim lessons with my daughter. You know, it's on Mondays and Wednesdays early in the morning uh, or, you know, mid-morning, 930 in the morning. Any of the dads who typically go, they have to take vacation days if they want to join um, when I hear them say that, I just, it's crazy to me. As I mentioned, I love traveling. So if I had to give up vacation days just to go to a swim class, that would be really tough for me. So to know that I can shift around my schedule in order to be there for my family, to live the lifestyle that we want to have, um, you know, that's, that's, that's been fantastic for us. Yeah. That, that's what it's all about. That's the reason we do this, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so Joel, if somebody's looking to get in touch with you, maybe to partner with you or they want to learn more about uh, your business, where can they find you? Yeah, uh, I'm on Bigger Pockets. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, uh, jfhcapital.com. You can also find me there. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I'm partnering up with uh, Rick, uh, PD out of Northwest Indiana. Uh, in order to kind of tackle some of these larger projects. Um, we uh, are going to be branding ourselves as Sandhill Capital Partners. So uh, sandhillcp.com uh, is going to be our new site that'll be popping up here in the next couple weeks. So uh, reach out any of those uh, places. Otherwise, joelflork at gmail.com works as well. That's great. Well, Joel, just want to say thanks so much for uh, taking the time and sharing your uh, success with us today. Yeah, really appreciate being here. And uh, yeah, let's make uh, 2019 an exciting year. This sounds like a plan. Perfect. And uh, to you, our viewers, I wish you well in your journey from purchase to profits. See you next time.